Good morning, church family. Ah, oh, come Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord. I thank you for the word of the Lord this morning. Thank you for that phenomenal time in your presence. Keep coming. Let the glory of the Lord fill this place, every heart, every life. God, we're asking for transformation from glory to glory, not just a nice meeting, but Lord, change us. Break in, crack it open. We love you, Holy Spirit. Ha! <laughs> You are welcome here. More, Lord. Say it. More, Lord. <laughs> Come on. Anointed words. More, Lord. Just take over. Uh, well, I want to speak a message today. This is a, a theme this month about uh, now is the time. And really feel burning on my heart about now is the time for greater levels of holiness, of purity of God course correcting us where he wants to because I believe we are headed for greater levels of phenomenal glory. Somebody say amen. This is an invitation from God. I want to quote uh, Carol Arnott's dream. She had a dream a bit ago. It's been all over the world. Even Bethel uh, TV I heard has got one of the greatest hits is when she's sharing her dream. And in essence, it's this in the dream she was in this building. And it was like the Lord was saying, I'm coming with such unprecedented glory, but I'm purifying. I'm just summarizing the dream, purifying my church. And even in the dream, she saw somebody and she was calling them out saying, you, sir, you know, there's something going on with your secretary and God is saying, get it right. And, and it's like this double-edged sword. God wants to come with the sword of the Lord to take us into greater heights of his fire, of his glory, of his presence. But he's also saying, if you want to take this, if you want this, I want you pure. I want you uh, redeemed. You know, there's something about God is coming without measure on a people without mixture. And so that's where we're at right now. So let's talk about this. Let's go into this. Even in Psalm 24, if you want to turn there, you can. But Psalm 24, it talks about verse 3. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? He who was clean hands and a pure heart. Whoa. Who has not lifted up a soul to an idol. But then it goes on to say, verse 7, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, for the King of glory to come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, because He is coming. Do you see the tie in there? Who's ascending the hill? He was clean hands and a pure heart. Then, King of glory, come in. There's something to this church. He wants to come. Greater levels of fire. I just, I see it in my mind's eye. I see it in the spirit realm that there's going to be people getting out of wheelchairs on a regular basis. That they're coming out of those stretchers. That we can go into a hospital ward and see people leave because they no longer need the services. Come on, even in sick kids hospital. Kids, terminal cancer, be healed. It, I believe it. But you know, it's like God is saying, prepare, prepare, prepare. And you know, um, in, in Jewish tradition, if you've ever been to Israel, you'll see excavation shows these, these ritual baths and purifying baths, as well as there was all these things to do before they would enter the temple or before they would enter into the Holy of Holies with the priest. You know, I, I'm grateful, obviously the blood of Jesus that saves us, okay? Let's not get that complicated here, that it is Jesus who saves us, it is by his blood, by faith, we are saved. But as 1 Corinthians 3 says, the foundation of Jesus Christ, but then build on it, is it wood, hay, sto stubble, or uh, gold, silver, precious stones? Because that which passes the test of fire is what we want to build on that foundation of Jesus Christ. In other words, how are we living our lives? How are we living our lives? How are we living our, our lives that we would come into his glory and into his presence. You know, uh, I have a nursing degree. Some of you know that. I worked in that field for seven years. And uh, we were always taught about Florence Nightingale. Florence Nightingale is the first nurse, no nurse. She was in the early 1800s in England, worked in the Crimean War with uh, soldiers. And these soldiers were dying like en masse, as well as people just in England itself were dying. And she said, she came up with the fact that we must have sanitary conditions. In other words, wash your hands, wash these instruments. Now, even when I worked in the OR or operating room, 
it was a big rigmarole. Wash your hands for a certain amount of time, mask, gloves, and all the instruments had to be sterilized because why? Preventing infection. That was the deal. And there was, you know, this, this caused deaths to go way down in that war as well as in England itself. And then, of course, it's standard practice now. But I believe in this preventative thing, preventative medicine, right? Did you know that 80% or more of conditions, physical conditions, have to do with lifestyle, bad diet, you know, uh, um, things like lifestyle, I don't know, addiction, smoking, drinking, whatever. But here's the deal, is that I believe also in preventative holiness. <laughs> Does that make sense? In other words, God wants to save us from pits of the enemy, traps of the enemy. Traps that he sets for us to steal our destiny and our calling. You know, when God says to abide by his laws and his rules, it's not because he's a party pooper. I think God's the funnest thing around. Come on. The joy of the Lord is our strength. But it's because he knows what's good for us. And he knows that if we will walk away from those things that are, you know, not of him, it preserves us to live out our calling and destiny. You know, I was having a conversation with one of our interns from Sweden, Oscar, and he was telling me, he was saying, you know, it's just standard practice in, in the church in Sweden about, you know, that young people are expected to sleep together before they're married. He just says it's not even talked about because it's just normal practice. Now, I'd like to challenge all that our culture says with this. What does the Word of God say? What does the B-I-B-L-E say? that we go back to a biblical worldview. What does God say? He is wanting to prevent us, if you will, from these very traps. Whitney, jump up here really quick. I want you to hear a testimony. If you're here on Friday night, you heard this, but Whitney is uh, in my women's group. She's a private investigator. You do not mess with this woman. She will get out her. <laughs> she can find out everything about you. Whitney, uh, just tell us your story real quick. Yeah, so uh, I was living in the homosexual lifestyle for about five years, and I, I had actually started coming here around 2012, and a former porn star named Shelly Lubin, um, she had come here and shared her testimony, and I heard her, I was just like, oh my God, this is so crazy that, you know, A, that a, a church is allowing someone to speak on something so real that happens, so anyways, I was sitting over there, came forward, gave my heart to the Lord, love broke it. But God's really showed me over the last, uh, about a couple of years, what brought me in it. Because, you know, I believed the lie that I was born that way. And it is a lie because we're not. We know who we are. We know, you know, God made us in his image. So God showed me. So God showed me basically like three things, you know, it's a lot of choices obviously that take us into sin, but three things, you know, that kind of kept me in it. One was I had an offense from a church from when I was a kid. So I let in unforgiveness. I, I became bitter, guarded heart towards God. I was exposed to pornography when I was around 12 years old unintentionally, and I learned sex in a perverted way. And then, you know, that of course, you know, I had, I had issues with men. I didn't trust men and, and things like that. But God is so good to like change it. And, and love broke it up here for me. You know, of all the Christians that, you know, I talked to and dealt with, they were just trying to judge and persecute and everything else. And love is what's gonna break every bit of brokenness that anybody's going through. So put on love every day. Come on. Mel, can we pray for her and, and some of the, just gather a few people. Wow, I believe that we are going to see these in this lifestyle coming to Jesus and really freedom. I love the song Kendrian uh, and Lauren led in this morning. He's a chain breaking God. He's a freedom fighting God. There is no pit so deep, he's not deeper still. So yes, blood of Jesus, but here's Philippians 2, it says, this work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. In other words, we go through a sanctification process. Did anybody here become perfect right away? Yes, your spirit, but it's the old man, it's the old nature that's sanctified. That word sanctifies means to be set apart, to be dedicated, consecrated, separate, made holy, a state of holiness. 
And that's where we're at. That's the journey we're on. And I believe God is saying this morning, he wants to set people free. You know what I see in my spirit? I see deliverance. Anybody need deliverance? Come on. Demonic stuff getting out. There's an, a precious gal this morning, major deliverance in first service. God is wanting to set us free from the things that, you know, we feel like we bang our heads against the wall. Paul said this in Romans 7. He said, I do the things I do not want to do. And he said, oh, wretched man that I am. Anybody, I, I've had that, you know, a few years of the spirit of stupid, 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 like doing things I don't even want to do. Oh God, help me. And you know, the need to be set free sometimes from those entities of darkness that have somewhere along the line had legal right to our hearts and lives. But here's the thing, engage in the battle. Engage in the battle, church. We want to engage in the battle, this battle between the spirit and the uh, flesh. The spirit of the flesh, it's Galatians 5 that talks about that. The spirit wars against the flesh. So walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you want. So how is going to win? Who's going to win? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that he will reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Who's going to win? Flesh or spirit? Who do you feed? Which one do you feed? It's like the dog fight, right? The two dogs fighting. Who's going to win the dog fight? The dog you feed. That's the one who wins. What's going through the eye gates? What's going through the ear gates? What, what do you do with your downtime? What do we do? What do I do with my downtime? I, I, you know, you don't have to sit in a corner and, and read your Bible 24 seven. But I do think that there is something that God is saying, I'm going after holiness, even in families. What's playing through that TV screen? What's playing, you know, in the, in the music that you're listening to? There's something about God saying, I want to build your spirit. I want to build your spirit. I want to engage in the war. Engage in the war over your mind. I remember being bombarded with negative, negative thoughts, you know, for a period of time in my life, and it was so bad. And it's like when the Bible says, take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, that's a lot of work. But guess what? It's worth it. Hello? It's worth it. When you start to see, hey, I'm gaining ground in this battle of my mind. I'm gaining ground in the renewing of my mind, which absolutely changes everything. That's Ephesians 4, 23, 24, about the old man going off, the new man coming in. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And so it's worth the battle. By the way, it's worth the battle in your families. Did you know that? If you work on your kids now when they're little to say we're going to curb how much you're watching on that TV or in that gaming or whatever, if we're just going to set some godly rules about what you're listening to. Guess what, parents? You save yourself a whole lot of trouble later on. And I think that God wants to set us free from lazy parenting, if that's okay, as well as couch potato Christianity. Come on. God is saying it's time for holiness. It's time for purity. I want you to know something, that there's such a power of darkness in secret. And that's why God said, walk in the light. Walk in the light. That you, it, it, it's in this place of darkness because we want to be able to say like Jesus said in John 14, he, the enemy, has got nothing in me. He's got nothing in me. Psalm 17, you've tested my heart. You've visited me in the night. You've tried me and have found nothing. Oh my goodness, to be able to say that. You know, when I was a kid and growing up and there was just some difficult times, I would escape into this world of my own in my mind. And my world was that I was a ranch owner in Texas. Yep, yep, yep. And I just, you know, I, I, that's where my world was. So whenever I wanted to escape, I escaped in this world of tech and I horses and all that. And I loved horses and I trained horses when I was growing up as well. But anyways, you know, when I was getting older and anytime I would escape into some world, God began to convict me and say, Patricia, guess what? You need to grow up basically. But, but he's saying, I don't want you to escape. Uh, and, and by the way, I do think if there's a weakness in men having to do with eye gates or pornography, and by the way, John has found by far the freedom, not for John, he never actually was a problem with pornography, but in the men's ministry, 
is accountability. Come on, accountability, accountability, walking in the light, walking with somebody that comes alongside of you. But for women, the weakness would be the mind. And that's why the Harlequin romances, and that's why the chick flicks, and that's why, you know, I remember Joyce Meyer saying, uh, a one woman, that she was so caught in a fantasy world that there was nothing getting done in the house. And when her husband would come home, a little bit overweight with one missing tooth, she'd be like, ooh, because he wasn't Prince Charming in her dream life. Anybody talk? All right, come on, I'm talking to somebody out here. And so I remember when the Lord just began to convict me saying, you need to talk to John. You need to confess this. You need to get this in the light. And as I, as I did that and, you know, you know, received prayer and ministry in this area, that thing finally was broken, that habit, if you will. And I found something. I found that even my pres uh, the presence of God in my life or the anointing went up after that. And I'm thinking, why was I ever hanging on to anything that God was putting his finger on. You know what, God is putting his finger on stuff today. God is putting his finger on saying, saying, why are you choosing to receive or allow any form of compromise, any form of compromise? Because it hinders you from the best that I have for you. And I want to pour out my spirit. I wanna pour out my glory like you've never seen before. And this is a time of the crucible. This is a really good word from um, Cindy Jacobs this week. She's saying that many of you feeling like you're in a pressure cooker, a crucible. My child, you are going to come out of this as pure gold for it's a season of refining. This is a season where I'm asking people, would you choose the difficult jobs in life for my kingdom? Would you be willing to go to the high places rather than to walk in the low places where you just get by and you take care of yourself and a few others? And she goes on to talk about this word. It's time to pull into me, says the Lord. It's time to crawl into my presence if you have to. It's time to be intentional about being a person of presence, a person who spends time with me, a person of intimacy, because if you, if you do not crawl into that place, Place, you might not be able to do what I've called you to do. Don't whine and don't pity yourself when the crucible time comes. For I promise you only the wheat, the hay, and the chaff will burn off of you. It'll be those things that are lasting. The fires of opposition come. Know this. If you're not going the right way, there would never be any fires of opposition. Take it as a challenge. Rise up and say, greater is he that is in me. This will not take me under. I'm not going under. I'm going to be a champion in life. I'm going to be victorious. I called to triumph. Come on. Whatever God is putting his finger on, it is so worth it. Do you know that sometimes we have blind spots? Blind spots? Psalm 19 says this, verse 12, who can understand his errors and cleanse me from secret fault? Cleanse me from secret fault. Guess what? Pride doesn't come to you and say, hey, hello, guess what? You're prideful. <laughs> you know what? Pride is, is hides itself. The sins hide itself. It's, it's where we got to stop saying, if this husband would just smarten up, you know, if these kids would straighten up and just listen to me, then everything would be fine. Oh, how about what's going on in me, God? What are you doing in me? Psalm 139 ends this way, search me, know my heart, try me, see if there be any wicked way in me. God, what are you saying to me? God, what are you doing? Because you know what? I can't change all these other people, but I can change me. And you know, I believe that one of the greater tests in leadership is this, what do you do with criticism? What do you do when people don't like you? Because it comes, it might come through social media, it might come through whatever. But here's the deal, it's like how you respond to criticism. And I just love this passage in uh, Psalm 31 that Jesus quoted David by saying, into your hands I commit my spirit. Hey God, I'm yours, I'm yours, so therefore this problem coming against me, these winds of opposition blowing against me, guess what, it's your problem because I'm yours. And if, if we've got you know, stuff in us though, it, it, we want to get rid of it so that we're not inviting the winds of opposition. Does that make sense? Purify me, but then, hey, God, deal with those that rise against me. You are my defender. You are the God of justice. There's a, a guy you're not going to know, so don't try to figure it out. He lives thousands of miles away, and I'm part of different, you know, uh, leadership of, in the nation. But the Lord spoke to me one time. He said, I want you to talk to this young man. It's like the Ezekiel 3, you know, I'm asking you to say something. And if you don't, the blood's on your head. If you do, 
uh, the blood's on his head. And so I, uh, I, I like, you know, giving those nice prophecies. How many like the prophecies? Like, oh, you're amazing, and you're going to win the lottery. Yay, you're going to become a millionaire. Everybody loves those prophecies, right? You know, it's like, and, and, and they like you when you give those prophecies. However, it's like the Lord spoke to me and said, you're going to start to prophesy things people don't want to hear. And I'm like, oh, you know, where that um, the need to please men has to go. Anyways, the word was this, it just said, uh, and I try to be really humble, and I said, my life and all the healing that God has done in me, but I was talking about, I really believe that the Lord is saying to, to go after some more healing about the father heart. He had been abandoned when he was a, a boy, and, and anyways, because I, I just said, I feel like God is saying, it's time to get more healing, and if it doesn't happen, I'm concerned what is going to happen and, and then closely associated with a friend of mine and uh, I just don't want to see this ministry blow up you know and that was the word and wonk, it was not well received put it that way and uh, you know just kind of talk bad about me to other leaders and I'm like oh okay God you signed me up for this job can you help me out here anyways so fine you know year year and a half goes by and sure enough just in this and I have no joy in this okay I just want you know but in the last few months it's been revealed, this guy who's married, has had an affair, got another girl pregnant, uh, everything's blown up, and the marriage is blown up, and this is really affecting the ministry, and I'm just like, oh my goodness. I take no pleasure. But what I want to say is this, the kind messenger is going out. The kind messenger is going out. I believe it. I believe his kind messenger is going out to us today. What is it that I'm putting my finger on? What is it that I'm dealing with? Because you don't want your sins blast on CNN. Hello, that's what's happening right now. The Me Too, Too movement and whatever. It's because God is going after the secret sin, church, and it begins with the house of the Lord. Judgment begins with the house of the Lord. It's time to come higher. It's time to say, God, go ahead. Bring on the crucible. Bring on the south winds. Feels like a scary thing to do. I remember when I started praying for patience, I'm like, oh, wow, did I? Uh, all these opportunities to be patient, you know? Uh, but in the end, it's good. And God is saying, embrace it. Embrace it. Embrace the crucible. Embrace the purifying. What is it? Maybe it's big things. Maybe it's little things. For me, you know, I thought, oh, God, I can get by with, you know, every so often just having my own ranch in Texas. But God was saying, no, I'm actually asking you to give that up. And do you want to know something? I don't, I, you know, God is patient and he's kind. How many of you know that what was okay two years ago is not okay now? Do you know that sort of thing? Where he's kind. In other words, you know, you come to Jesus, you don't have to stop smoking right away. But the, pro the thing is, God will probably work on you because he wants you to have good health. And he, he, I have a sister who smoked for like, oh, 30, 40 years. And then the Lord just began to speak to me. He said, I want you praying for your sister. And so I began to pray for my sister about smoking. And uh, sure enough, you know what she said to me? She said, uh, unbelievable. She said, I just really, re I just asked God to help me. And now I'm free of smoking. Hallelujah. 40 years of smoking. Nothing is too powerful for God. Nothing. And I believe that there's blind spots sometimes. You know, I, I was asked by Carol Arnott one time, I was not happy about this, not a happy camper, when she said, Patricia, I think you need more inner healing. I'm like, I have had so much inner healing. How about John? He should go for inner healing. <laughs> Man, Richie Cunningham, that's his name when growing up. Anybody know Richie Cunningham? He's like perfect, right? Thought I married Mr. Perfect, but then I'm, you know, after marriage, I found out he wasn't exactly perfect, but close. Anyways, so I am on an airplane. I am going to uh, Hendersonville, North Carolina with my American parents, Chester and Betsy Kilstraw. And I arrived and I said to them, look, I just want you to know, I am here out of honor and obedience. I really know there's nothing wrong with me. They're like, okay, thank you for coming out of honor and obedience. Do you want to know something? That turned out to be one of the deepest, most phenomenal healing times I have had. And it, it was blind spots I didn't see. Stuff from way back where this little girl, I, I saw this vision hiding, cowering, and, and it was all these irritations that would come that trigger points. And I don't know, all I know it was I was a changed person. You can talk to my husband, he'll say the same. It was worth it. And we don't 
always see our own issues. That's why we need each other. That's why we're part of the body of Christ. That's why we're not all an eye, we're not all in the ear, whatever, but we need each other. And so God is going after this today. Holiness, purity, how do we get there? Number one, confession. Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sins will not prosper. Whoever confesses and forsakes him will have mercy. I want mercy. And he says this in Hosea 14. I love this. One and two. He says, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Oh. Take words with you and return to the Lord. In other words, speak it out. God, I have failed in this area. God, I need help in this. God, help me reveal the blind spots in me. Take words with you. Return to the Lord. I believe that God's saying that for this morning. Return to him. Come back. Come back and say, God, I've blown it here, there, wherever. It, it is like taking away that empowerment from secret sins and walking in the light. Accountability. And here's another one. What did uh, Joseph do in context of Potiphar's wife? Talk to me. What did he do? He ran. He ran. What do we do? Faced with temptation. Faced with all the things that suck us back. You run the other way. That's what you do. You get out of there. You know what? I remember when I uh, broke up finally because God gave me a dream. Broke up with this boyfriend I had three and a half years. Big football star. Funny guy. All that stuff. Came to Jesus through me. And, and that was all nice. And by the way, we teach our kids you don't have to date 20 people before you find out who God has for you. That's another story. Uh, but anyway, so I was like um, needing to get free of some soul ties. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, Patricia, I want you to throw away every picture of the two of you together. I want you to give away or throw away anything he gave to you. I, and I said, well, Lord, I should pray for him, right? Because, you know, he's like, I don't even want you praying for him. I said, like, is this God? He said, I don't even want you praying for him. I will send other people to pray for him. I just want you free. Do you know that this guy would call me and I'd be like melting, you know? It's like, oh, I miss you so much, you know? And God said, don't take the phone calls. Come on. Because God said, run, 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 run. And hallelujah, because I married Mr. Wright. Praise God, <laughs> worth it. <laughs> Tears. <laughs> Richie Cunningham, Richie Cunningham. <laughs> In case you're wondering why he looks half the size, he's on a 40-day fast. Is that, oh, I shouldn't have said that, but you'll still get your reward because it was not you who said it. <laughs> tears, oceans of tears, guess what? They're good. Tears are good, saying, God, purify me. God, get rid of this. Those tears. They're worth it, it's worth it, it's worth it. Run the other way. Psalm 25, show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth. Thanks, Jonathan, I need you up here. Lead me in your truth, truth. Do you know what? It's time to get real with God. It's time to get real with yourself. It's time to get real with those around you who love you and say, let the crucible come. Truth, show me God. Show me what's in me that I don't even see because I want to deal with it. Come on, shock me now. Don't shock me in that day when I see you face to face and find out there was all this stuff that you called me to do that I didn't do because I had these areas in my life that you were going after and I played the dull eared game. Come on, it's time to hear the voice of the Lord. When he's saying, mm, I'm showing you this, I want this out. You know what, it's truth is the Hebrew, Hebrew word emet, and it is spelled with the first, the middle, and the last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Thus the rabbis concluded that truth upholds the first and the last of God's creation and everything in between. Jesus is truth. This word is truth. You can bank your life on it. Therefore, when it says things like, love your enemies, or it says things like, don't backbite with your tongue, or when it says in James 3 about, you know, the, how do you know teleos, spiritual maturity? Can you bridle your tongue? 
Oh, it's a tough one. Let's all stand together. Oh God, we want the greater glory. We want what you're pouring out. We want to see Isaiah 60. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Deep darkness covers the earth, but the Lord will arise over you. His glory will be seen upon you. Nations shall come to your light. God, we want it. We want to see the unprecedented signs and wonders. We want to see your presence in our marriages, in our families, in this church, in this nation. Yes, God, so do the preparatory work. Do what you need to do in us, in me.